Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word of God, Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to dismiss the children, fours and fives, out the back door, first through sixth graders out this side. With our theme of one Christ, one team, God's harvest, if we're going to be one team, there is going to be something that we must be good at, and that's forgiveness. To be one team, it's not like then we all must be perfect, because then that would be impossible, but we must be good at forgiveness. And Jesus shares with us in Matthew 18, really it's a personal conversation between Jesus and Peter. Matthew 18, we'll be reading verses 21 through the end of the chapter. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times you are seven, Peter. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down, worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me. I'll pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. He loosed him, forgave him the debt. But that same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, grieved, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because you asked me, because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? Even as I had pity on thee, and his Lord was very wroth, delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother. Let's open the message here in a word of prayer. Father, I pray that the truths from the word of God would make a difference in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. When I was in my early 30s, there was an issue, and I was really struggling with forgiving. It had really become a burden to me. It actually, that lack of forgiveness quickly grew into bitterness. I'd been saved over 20 years, but I could not get victory. I had my pastoral theology degree from Bible college, but I could not get victory. I had been an ordained minister at the time for almost 10 years, but I could not free myself of this burden of bitterness. I just couldn't forgive. So I was led to go to this passage of Scripture, Matthew 18, and I knew I needed God's power. It was beyond me to forgive. So I went to this passage just looking to the Lord. And I read it in the morning, and I read it before I went to bed at night. I was looking to the Lord for strength to forgive. And actually, in the course of a couple weeks, the Lord delivered me. And I still remember that. It was like, ha, finally, He delivered me. The Holy Spirit used God's Word to bring deliverance. And I want to meditate on the passage the Lord used in my life years ago. So let's start with Peter's question. Let's get into the mind of Peter. And Peter asks, how many times should we forgive someone? And then he answers his own question, kind of as a question, seven times? So Peter's acknowledging right away 
there is a human limit to how much, how often we forgive someone. I can sort of imagine him thinking, Lord, how strong really do you expect me to be? I mean, if I stretch my limits, how good could I be and forgive? What are my human limitations? Seven? And then the Lord just kind of blows Peter away. With his answer, Jesus sets his number in comparison with Peter's number, his limiting number. No, Peter, more twice what you're thinking. He didn't say that. No, three times what you're thinking. He didn't say that. He said this, 70 times what you believe your human limitations are. That's what my expectation is. I don't know if the Lord paused there, but he kind of let that settle on Peter, I believe. 70 times 7. And I don't know what Peter was thinking, but I know what I would have been thinking. Okay, <laughs> that's impossible. You just asked me to do something I can't do. And so often God asks us to do things that he knows we can't do. So we would fall on him for dependence. And that's what I believe is happening here. Peter's saying seven times. And Jesus said, no, 70 times, 70 times what you just said. <laughs> I can see Peter kind of gone. Right. And then God does something that he always does. Peter, you're struggling with this feeling of bitterness. Let me tell you something that will, and this is important, change your thinking. God tells us the thinking solution often to an emotional problem. A lack of forgiveness is filled with emotion. Bitterness is an emotion. And Jesus gives the solution to this negative emotion. The solution is right thinking. You cannot really directly control your emotions, but you can control your thinking. And God tells us what to think. My mind went to 1 Peter 2.25, which states that God is the shepherd of our soul. He's not just the shepherd of our outward actions, but he's the shepherd of our soul. And forgiveness is something that's in our souls. A lack of forgiveness is something that's in our souls. And Jesus shepherds us. He doesn't just say, stop it. Stop being bitter. Forgive. He doesn't just stop there. He tells us what to think. He goes deeper into our hearts. And he tells Peter this story. And that's how Jesus taught so often. It was allowing Peter to step outside and kind of observe this story happening. So then he could get this truth in his soul. So let me set up the framework of the symbolism of this story. It's pretty easy to understand. Jesus tells the symbolism at the end of the parable. So a king forgives a servant an enormous debt. That symbolizes how much our father has forgiven our sin. Here's the gospel. The key to the Christian life is to really getting, getting an understanding to having the right thoughts about God. Last Sunday, Pastor Chris, stop being afraid, don't fear. But he didn't walk away. <laughs> he said, so let's talk about our God, why we don't have to fear. And this story where Jesus says, Peter, forgive, 70 times seven, but he doesn't stop there. He says, let me tell you about your God. So a king forgives a servant an enormous debt. That symbolizes how much our father has forgiven our sin. But that servant would not forgive a smaller debt. That symbolizes our choice to not forgive someone else's sin against us. The king finds out, finds out responds with adding the debt back. And that symbolizes our broken relationship with God because of our refusal to repent of this lack of forgiveness. Now let me, a little important side note. You cannot build your systematic theology on parables. 
Jesus tells us what this parable is teaching. He said this parable is not about eternal security. It's about if you need, you need to forgive people. You'll, if you don't, you'll end up uh, paying for your sins in hell. No, that's not the lesson of the story. This passage speaks of our experiential relationship with God, not our position of justification. So this passage is talking about our sweet relationship with God if we don't forgive. So, the lesson. So, now let's jump in. Here, let's look at the mercy of the Master. And this is symbolizing God's mercy toward us as our Heavenly Father. So look at verses 23 through 27. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. When he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. And then verse 25 says he couldn't pay it. Verse 26, I think, pictures our salvation. The servant fell down, worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. I believe that God inspired the very words of Scripture. And the Bible says that. God didn't just kind of throw out some ideas to somebody and then they kind of kind of put generally uh, their thoughts together and here we have a, a book that's a good book. No, God superintended the writing of Scripture. And an important key to this story is the numbers that Jesus used, 10,000 talents. Uh, uh, R.A. Torrey's Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, the highest number known in Greek mathematical notation. This immense sum represents our boundless obligations to God and our utter incapacity as sinners infinitely indebted to divine justice, our utter incapacity of paying. So let's talk about this number. It's 60 million times the amount of common laborer make in, would make in a day. I was looking up recent Bible study. That it numbered the amount in today's money about $4 billion. That's a big amount, but that's the number Jesus used, 10,000 talents. And that represents our debt to the Lord. Now, kind of let that sink in. You know, if we were to pay that debt ourselves, we never could. We would spend an eternity in hell. Before I got saved, that thought, if I pay for my sins, I will die and go to hell forever. And then when I got saved, I, I remember that. Our church was meeting in a public school gymnasium, the same public school I attended actually at the time as a grade school. And I remember getting saved and it was like, the debt is gone. I was so relieved. Well, that's what this 10,000 talents represents. And here this servant in the passage, he did not deserve his wife, his children, any earthly possessions. And we deserve nothing except an eternity in hell, separated from God. Every blessing of life is a bonus. We do not deserve to have a God who hears us and is faithful. We don't deserve our friends, our loved ones, our health, our home. These are all because of God's mercy. There is a song the Jews would sing, and we're going to look at it. It's song number 136, or I could say Psalm 136. So turn there, and that's the psalm that reminds us every good thing we have is because of God's mercy. We won't read the whole psalm, but it's a great passage just to soak in God's mercy and every good thing we have and every bad thing we don't have to suffer. It's because of God's mercy. Psalm 136, uh, we'll read verse 5 and, and a few verses there. To him that by wisdom made the heavens for his mercy endures forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. 
the sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. So as you enjoy God's creation, realize, oh, that's all because of God's steadfast love. He showed his mercy and he blesses me with creation. Let me read just the first, the last few verses of the psalm, verse 23 to 26. Who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endures forever, and has redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. And then this exclamation at the end, Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. Not only does God remove the punishment of eternal death in hell, he gives us this multitude of blessings. Somehow we as Americans think we deserve certain things. A house with at least three bedrooms, two baths, two cars, both with air conditioning. Here in Arizona, we've got to have air conditioning in our houses here in Phoenix. A certain supply of food, a certain variety of food, three meals a day, a bedtime snack, enough money left over to go out to eat every once in a while. And we think God owes us that. It is this mindset that our life needs to be at this level and that's what we deserve. Uh, there's a story in the Bible that illustrates God's mercy to us so well. And it's the story of Joseph's brothers to Joseph's kindness to his brothers. Turn to Genesis 50. Genesis 50, the background to Genesis 50 is this. We know Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. About 20 years later, they show up, get saved from famine. Dad shows up. About 20 years after that, dad dies. Joseph's brothers now are thinking, now Joseph will pay us back. They'd been living with false guilt for 40 years. Well, it was guilt, but they weren't trusting in Joseph's forgiveness for the past 20 years. Dad dies. They think now he's going to pay us back. And let's start reading in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say to Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, uh, Forgive the trespass of thy servants of the God of thy father. And look at Joseph's response. He wept when they spake unto him. He thought, I thought we had this conversation 20 years ago. And he was surprised. And then look at Joseph's mercy and his tender kindness with them. Verse 18, his brethren also went, fell down before his face. They said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Key lesson for forgiveness, and it's not my message today, but Joseph was saying, I'm not called by God to pay you back. That's God's job. I am not God the judge, he is. So Joseph understood, I'm not in God's place. Let's keep going. But as for you, you thought evil against me. Let me kind of stop. He didn't say, hey, it was no big deal. You sold me into slavery. A lot of jealous brothers do that. He didn't, he, you know, he did not do that. He recognized, and even in Psalms, it talks about the anguish that Joseph went through when they put him in fetters and dragged him off as a slave. So it was a very real sin that Joseph didn't go, no big deal. No, he said, you meant evil unto me, but, verse 21, excuse me, verse 20, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as, as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph's kindness, verse 21, now therefore fear ye not, I'll nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So, these brothers deserved at the very best slavery and poverty. But because of Joseph's mercy, they escaped the punishment that was due them. 
and received deliverance from that famine, and they were resting in their brother's mercy. With us, we have this important need to be constantly aware of the fact that all of the blessings that we enjoy are because of and dependent on God's mercy. Some scriptures to remind us, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it is of the Lord's mercies. We are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Psalm 86, verse 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Psalm 145, verse 8, the Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, of great mercy. Do you remember the relief that you experienced when you were saved, when your sin debt was forgiven? I do. And then the Lord gave me this illustration, this example, when I was going through Susie's cancer. We had gone to, the, we lived in North Carolina had gone to the Chicago area to a cancer treatment center and uh, for several months uh, she had her cancer treatment there. In the spring of 92, she was finished there with uh, cancer treatments and we were settling up what I owed. So I was in touch with the financial guy at the medical center and we were talking about how much I owed and this number was from the Lord. And he said, uh, right now, you owe $10,046. I thought he should have just like, <laughs> come on, 46, can we just kind of erase that 46? But he, he gave me that number. At the time, that was what I made in about 92, about, pro it would take me over six months, what I currently made at the, uh, my church and school in North Carolina. Uh, it would have taken me over six months to earn that. And I thought, okay. <laughs> it's like, where does the conversation go here? <laughs> and I, his name was Jerry. And I said, uh, so Jerry, what, uh, what's the arrangement? <laughs> you going to put me in prison? Because <laughs> I can't write a check for $10,000 right now. And he said, well, let me talk with the hospital administrator, and I'll get back with you. And I said, okay. And then I prayed. <laughs> and uh, th that was on a Monday. I had that conversation with Jerry. So a couple days later, uh, we talked again on the phone. And Jerry said, I spoke with the hospital administrator, and he has forgiven that debt. And that was a happy day. <laughs> I remember that because God used that 10000 which was a big amount of money for me, in my early 30s and not making a ton of money, it was like, ha, huh, it was gone. I remember that relief. Do you remember the relief that you had when you were saved? It's like, huh, he has released me of this debt. And that's important. That's such a key part of remembering God's mercy to you. It starts with your uh, remembering the gospel that God truly has forgiven you. That debt is gone. And now let's look at, back in our passage, go back to Matthew 18. And we're going to look at the vengeance of the servant. The vengeance of the servant. Verse 28. <clears throat> that same servant went out found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. He laid hands on him, took him by the throat. You see the emotion here, paying, saying, pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. And he would not. And he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Now remember I talked about the very words of God are important. He used 10,000 talents, God's forgiveness for me. And then he used 100 pence, representing someone else's sin against me. Now here's 100 pence, 100 days of wages for a common laborer. And this servant himself was a common laborer. So it would have been the amount that uh, probably about a third of his annual income, not a small amount, 
this amount would be felt. It would be, in today's money, not 20 bucks, not 100 bucks, but think four months of wages. So it's not an insignificant, uh, somebody borrowed 20 bucks to go to in and out and they didn't pay me back. Nope. It's four months of your wages. It's a big amount. So God's not saying somebody walked past you in church and forgot to say hello. That's not the sin. The sin represented here is a, is a deal. It's a big deal. Now here's the key to the whole story, is the comparison. So now we're going to compare 100 pence and 10,000 talents. Someone's sin against me that's significant. And God forgiving my sin. So it's a striking comparison. 10,000 talents is 600,000 times greater than 100 pence. Uh, let, me, let me say that again. This is Jesus' words. 10,000 talents, what God forgave me, is 600,000 times greater than 100 pence. 10,000 talents, symbolic of my sin debt to God. Every sin I commit is a direct sin against God. The magnitude of God's forgiveness is enormous. The mercy of God toward me is immense. It's the highest number known in Greek mathematical notation as this 10,000 talents. And 100 pence is symbolic of someone's sin against me. The mercy I am to show is 600,000 times smaller than the mercy I enjoy. So pardon my math here, but I'm going to do some comparisons. So picture this room. And Emily, uh, I thought of Emily. Don't do the math in your head. Yeah, I thought of also Ethan Barnes that's going to be trying to do the math in his head here. But, so don't do it. But I filled this room up with sand. Okay, Melanie Qualman, sorry. That's going to be a big mess. But I'm going to fill up this room with sand. Wall to wall, wall to wall, all the way to the ceiling. The room's about 100 feet this way and 108 feet this way and 25 feet or so high, full of sand. Okay? I'm going to give you the comparison. That's 100 pence. <laughs> That's, if, if I filled this box up with sand this Christmas box that my wife found for me this morning. <laughs> if I fill this with sand, that's the comparison. That's the comparison Jesus used. Peter, who's sitting there, and Jesus said, let me tell you a story, Peter, why you should forgive a lot. And he used 10,000 talents, and he used 100 pence. It's like, oh, Someone sinned against me. The volume of this room is how much God has forgiven me. That's the comparison. So realize, oh, that's how I'm supposed to be able to forgive. I compare this with how much God's asking me to forgive if you did it with weight, so that was volume. If you did it with weight, I did this math too. A full-grown African elephant is how much God showed me mercy. A third of an ounce. The comparison. The mercy that God expects of me. If I could count as God counts, and that's what Jesus is expecting. If I could count as God counts. If I could see as God sees, I would see the comparison and I would not find it so difficult to forgive. But you know what? I don't count as God counts. I don't see as God sees. I actually often see the opposite. 
my sin, yes, real sin, here's what I see. My sin is about this big. Their sin is about this big. That's what we think. That's when we count the way we count, when we don't count the way God counts. The person's sin against me is this. My sin, I'm struggling with forgiveness. I know I should forgive. It's about this size. I know it's wrong. I'm struggling, but come on. It's not that big of a sin. But that's what we do. And when I was plagued with bitterness that I mentioned, I, did, I was thinking their sin was big and I struggle a little bit with forgiveness, not that big of a deal. When I began to see as God sees, when over time as I was soaking in this passage, I really began to see as God sees. And then I got that freedom. I was able to forgive. I began to count differently. It flipped my thinking. And it was huge. And here is what God can help you see. God can help you see this and then deliver you. Now, it's very important. It was very important for me to see that in the story, who is the culprit? I was, because I was not forgiving. The scoundrel in the story was not the person that sinned against me. I was the, I was the culprit. I was the sinner. I was the, the scoundrel. And that was the key to God delivering me, to unburdening me, was Oh, now I see my sin. And God, would you forgive me for this sin? I need to confess my sin of bitterness. And once you confess your sin, and once I confessed my sin, God poured his grace into my soul. I love the movie, Ben-Hur. I'm ashamed, Mrs. Deaton, that I never read the book. I only watched the movie, but I love the movie. My family got it for me, the 50th anniversary collector's edition. I love that movie, and the story is the bad guy basically throw, threw the good guy's family in jail, and they got leprosy. I'm not gonna retell the whole story, but the whole story is about Ben-Hur's vengeance. He's going to get the bad guy. Well, the way the story ends is Ben-Hur is kind of walking up some stairs, and you see his face change. It was Charlton Heston. His face changes, and he said something like, God took the knife out of my hand. He delivered me from my bitterness. And it was like, ha, ha. <laughs> and it was this great deliverance. God gives grace. Now, I'm not saying Ben-Hur is scripture, so don't, don't get mixed up here. But that is such a wonderful story of, I was free of my vengeance. So the key, you have to see yourself as the real sinner. I'm the real culprit. I actually need to confess my sin. Of bitterness. And once you confess your sin, God pours grace into your soul. God gives grace to the humble. A humble person acknowledges his own sin. A proud person doesn't see himself as God sees him. And God resists the proud. When I was struggling with forgiveness, I was not humbling myself. But God helped me see myself. And then, hallelujah, he delivered me. The weight of bitterness was gone. Your first step to gaining victory over any sin is to see it as God sees it. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
if we confess homilageo, to say the same, in other words, you say the same as God says, and with me, my lack of forgiveness was a struggle, was something I need to get over, was a sin. And that was the key to me getting released from this weight of bitterness. God freed me. Examples of what confession is not. Lord, I'm kind of struggling with forgiving so-and-so, but you know how much I've had to put up with. So I've confessed this little sin of bitterness to you. You sort of give lip service to confession because you know you're supposed to, but you really don't see it as that bad. That's not confession. In Matthew 18, the master saw the hypocrisy. I forgave you this much and you won't forgive. The master saw it. The fellow servants saw it. Look at verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, this guy not forgiving 100 pence and he was forgiven 10,000 talents. When the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. They were grieved. The master saw it. The fellow servants saw it. And then in my life, I saw it. And that was, that was the key. It was like, oh, I saw the hypocrisy. And that's where we need to get to. You've got to see your lack of forgiveness as sin, which is how God sees it. So we've seen the mercy of the master. We've seen the hypocritical vengeance of the servant. But the reaction of the master... He, and we've, we've touched on this and said this. It says this, look at verse 31. This is what the master calls the one who would not forgive. So I, I read, it, read verse 31, his fellow servants saw what was done. They were very sorry, came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called them, said unto him, now this is in the story, the symbolism is God the Father's comments toward us. The king's comments toward the servant that would not forgive. Oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you asked me. Shouldn't thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was angry. So let's, let's look at that. God says, you are and the word there is wicked, it's malicious, it's evil. A Christian who has not forgiven a brother, yes, will still go to heaven. But because of this sin, he will not have a fellowship with the Father. I commit a sin, I go to God, I ask forgiveness, fellowship is restored. But when I have not forgiven someone, God will not forgive me and restore that fellowship. James 2, 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Turn to James chapter 3. Turn to James chapter 3. And this is so counter to our human emotion. It's so counter to the world's way of thinking. And that's why we have the word of God. James 3, verse 14 but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above. It is earthly and sensual and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. Now look at, in contrast, verse 17, wisdom that is from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. So, wisdom from above, it's full of mercy. I want to turn over to look at the book of Philemon, and I want to close the message in Philemon. Philemon is a, is a great little book, and it's a story about Onesimus, Philemon, slave owner. 
Onesimus, a slave. Onesimus has escaped his master. He, he was a runaway slave from Philemon. He had robbed his master and he fled to Rome. Now this would make a great movie, but what happens to Onesimus? Somehow he meets Paul and he gets saved. And he becomes a convert. And then Paul said this, Onesimus, you need to get right. You ran away from your master. He was probably an indentured servant. It's, it's like he probably owed a debt and was there working for Philemon and had to work so long uh, before he paid that debt. He ran away. He got saved. And Paul said, you need to go back and you need to go back to your master. And he did with this letter in his hand, the book of Philemon. And let's look at verse 10. Paul's writing to Philemon, the slave owner, and the letter's being carried by the slave. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, who have I, I've begotten in my bonds, which in time past to thee was unprofitable. <laughs> he ran away. But now he's profitable to you and to me. So here Paul, a source of mercy for Philemon, asked Philemon to forgive and show some mercy. Verse 17, we'll drop down to verse 17. If you, Philemon, count me, Paul, a partner, receive him as myself. If he's wronged thee or owes thee aught, put it on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I'll repay it. And then he adds this, albeit, I do not say to thee how you owe unto me even your whole life besides. So here's Paul with a letter saying, Philemon, would you forgive Onesimus? And Paul was a source of mercy to Philemon. What's Philemon going to do? <laughs> He's kind of like, Okay, I surrender, forgiven. Now, this passage. Can you picture Christ himself? The source of unbelievable mercy. I don't have to go to hell because of Christ. He saved my life, not just my eternity, but he saved my life. When I think about my cousins in Omaha, our family got saved, and all my cousins' families, they didn't get saved. So I could see what happened in their lives. Oh, this is a life, a Christian family. And this is, these are lives of people that don't follow Christ. And I can easily see God's mercy. He saved me from that. So now that same Christ is coming to me. And say, Mark, you remember how I forgave you? Would you forgive? What can I say? I can either hang on to my bitterness and completely ignore God's love. If I soak in, meditate in the gospel and how much God loves me, and God cares for me. It sure is going to be a whole lot easier to forgive someone. What did Jesus say 490 times? It's impossible without the truth of the gospel. If you aren't, and we all know it in our heads, but when I was struggling years ago in my early 30s with not forgiving, and I soaked in this passage, and I began to realize how much God forgave me. Eternity in hell and then a, a rescued life. <sighs> okay, <laughs> I can give that up. When God tells us to forgive, he doesn't just say, stop it. He tells us to meditate on the gospel and the glorious relief we find in his forgiveness. 
Ephesians 4.32, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And we probably, many of us, could quote the rest of that verse. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. If you enjoy God's forgiveness and salvation, surely you can forgive. But it's not in your own strength and your own. It's impossible. Again, back to the beginning of the story, Peter says, hey, how much do I need to forgive someone? Seven times? He probably was feeling pretty good about, he thought he could work hard and have enough self-control to forgive seven times. And Jesus said, nope. 70 times what you just said. And Peter's just like kind of blown away. And then Jesus said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> let me give you some right thinking to help you with this emotion of bitterness. Just think about how much I forgave you. And if you really continually stay aware of God's mercy, you're going to become really good at forgiving. Not because you're some strong person and can just put that out of your mind. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with staying in the gospel, with realizing, oh, remember that, I remember that relief I found May 24th, 1970 in that grade school gymnasium. I remember getting saved and walking away and thinking, ha. Oh, I don't have to worry about the rapture. I don't have to worry about dying in my sleep. I am free of my sin. I need to remember that. And when I remember that, then I can forgive. Now let me talk to you in this room. Maybe you've never experienced that. I plead with you, come to Christ. He can erase every debt. He can let it all go. You can be free of all that sin. If you've not experienced that, I plead with you, come to Christ today. Speak to someone who brought you today. We want you to find Christ. I want you to know that relief of forgiveness of sin. If you as a Christian are struggling with forgiveness, release that. Start with thinking about how much God forgave you. Ask God's power. With me, it, it, what I remember was soaking in this passage and just saying, Lord, help. And in a couple weeks, it was gone. Now, since that time, that was 30 years, over 30 years ago, that sin still kind of hits me. But here's the difference. It doesn't have grab. It's, it's like Satan tempting me with something. It's like a fiery dart that glances off. It comes in my mind, it's like, no way. <laughs> I don't want to go back there. I want to think about the truths of Matthew 18 and how much God forgave me. And that was 30 years ago. Nothing so weighty as bitterness. And I was, I was struggling. And I thought, this is impossible. I can't get, I can't get, I can't get over this. I need your help. Lord, help. And I went to Matthew 18 and soaked in Matthew 18, and it was free. I was free of that. And Satan, yes, he still shoots fiery darts, but it does not have any grab in my heart. So are you struggling with forgiveness? See it as God sees it. Confess that sin. Confess the sin of your lack of forgiveness. Don't just... I'm going to do better. Confess the sin. Restore your relationship with God because bitterness hurts your relationship with God. Confess that sin. See it as God sees it. And move on in freedom. You don't have to be burdened down with that.